Your attention, please. Paul and Alex are required to proceed to the gate immediately. What? No way. What is happening here? This is the last call for the Layovers podcast. Really? Come on, man. This is our thing. We got this. Oh, yeah. And we made it. Of course, geeks. Flight 77 to Honolulu. Oh, very exotic. I <laughs> That's like exotic. It. I must say, this is not the airport we were hinting at in the last episode because we decided to record an additional episode before my big trip. We're recording today on Tuesday, the 14th of August. I'm about to leave on that trip, which I'm not still telling you where. And that will be the airport for the next one. And we decided to do... One simple airport, because I've been once. Have you ever been yourself? When I was an infant, so no, not really. But that counts, man. Yeah. Not on your... (laughs) It's 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 somewhere logged in a in a log book, but it's obviously being on the West Coast. It's a very popular place to go for uh, vacationing Californians. So it's uh, yeah, it feels appropriate place to do. So you just said you have a log somewhere. So were your parents logging? No, for no, you? I only started doing it about <laughs> six or seven years ago, and that's only yeah. because technology made it so much easier. Yeah, because I'm really sometimes sad to try to attempt to find what flights I used to do when I was a kid. I have like a few tidbits of information here and there, but I wish I had everything logged just for the fun of saying, oh, I've been in that route or I've done that aircraft and I just don't remember. Yeah, yeah, I I think about that too. I wonder if there's old passports lying around where I could at least get an idea of, of comings and goings, especially with flying out of Hong Kong so often because you had outbound immigration, so you'd have a stamp going oh, out yeah. so you'd, you'd have a pretty good idea of the dates that uh, that you flew you see when you retire that's where you're that's gonna do you're gonna spend like a year trying to figure out all your old flights <laughs> <laughs> By the way, guys, so we're a bit following the Terminator type of timeline here because we've been recording once a week, which is a bit what we used to do in, in the beginning, but yeah. we're not releasing the episodes right away. So this will not be on the air before at least probably the 22nd or 23rd, because we realize that by the time I return, that's the 23rd, Alex will be about to herd his family back from California to the green pastures of England. And we're not sure when we're going to be able to record. So we said, okay, let's do this one. You see, guys, we're thinking about you because our last three episodes were very popular. Yeah, they were. And they were fun, too. They were fun to record. So I'm glad people are uh, are, are enjoying them. Actually, I I haven't seen this much social media activity around the episodes in a long time. So that's (laughs) that's very exciting to see. Yeah, it is. And the stats are very good as well. So why Honolulu? Because uh, we're still going to have quite a lot of news about uh, the U.S. here. And it's in one of these places that is transitioning between Asia and the U.S. and vice versa. And it's a holiday destination since this will be probably our last episode of August. Well, August is holiday, so why not? I just figured it's a good idea. And also because when I did Honolulu, I think, what, eight years ago probably or something, I did it from... Narita. Yeah, with, that's very popular too. Yeah, with what used to be Northwest, which is now Delta. Interestingly, because I mentioned that a little bit in the last episode when we were talking about Delta, about my flight, and I said that landed at Narita, which seemed a bit empty. And just like maybe a day or two after we ended up recording, Cranky Flyer uh, had a very good blog post saying that basically the Tokyo hub is dying because already United and AA have reduced. And Northwest, which was doing, this is why I was using a lot of Northwest, we're doing a lot of you know, Guam and Manila and all these places, which when it was taken over by Delta, at the beginning Delta was continuing this fifth freedom route and then kind of gave up on them. And now our since recently are in bed basically with Korean Air are transitioning their hub mostly to Incheon, which also could explain why Delta, I felt it wasn't as... Uh, I used to fly 747s and this was the 767 that was going to Honolulu. So I, I'm sure they, they just transitioned their strategy there. That whole strategy that especially Northwest had, but United had, well, actually it was Continental, had their Micronesia sub airline, Continental Micronesia. And then, as you said, Northwest had their Asian hub, which when I grew up in Hong Kong, you'd see all the time all these planes going from 
you know, Hong Kong to Saipan or Hong Kong to, I don't know, Okinawa or somewhere like that. It was sort of, it was the last connection to the Pan Am days where, yeah, where yeah. you could get these crazy, you know, from Tripoli to Zurich on Pan Am or something like that. I think it's really sad that it's going away, but I kind of understand it now with global alliances. There is really no need to have to defend a fortress, if you will, in in all these places where you have a a partner doing, having their home base there and doing obviously a very, very good job at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly the the point I was about to make is like the partner does the heavy lifting. So you just transition the passenger there and then you hand them off to, in that case, Korean Air or JAL or ANA, if you're still talking about Japan. I think that Delta has also had a, a hard time finding slots at Haneda. It's funny because Cranky Flyer says on that blog that Narita is almost transitioning into like a leisure airport and no more the business airport because, of course, most people would favor Haneda. Mm -hmm. As I said in the last episode, there's still like 33, 34 million passengers. It's not a small airport. And they are building a new runway at some point. They are expanding it. But it's true that with the addition of the low-cost terminal, maybe that's... uh, their goal is now to say, okay, we'll have cheaper flights going to Narita. I still contend that it's a good airport if you want to go on the west side of uh, the city, but yeah. So now Delta only flies from uh, Tokyo, I think, uh, Singapore, Manila, and Honolulu. That's it. It's a shame. I, I also wonder if there's going to be competition issues, which in turn turn into price issues, because it's been pretty competitive to get from the U.S. to, to Japan in the last few years. I wonder if we're yep. going to start to see that change with... Uh, maybe it won't be reduced capacity. I don't. I don't know. But it, it sure feels like that's the only way that this can go, which would be a damn shame. Well, and the other factor is probably the rise of these long haul aircrafts. They can just bypass Tokyo. You can go directly to Singapore, or directly to Hong Kong, that's without true. having to basically stop. Maybe that's also a, a reason. I don't know. That's true. Uh, still, we're talking about Sky Team. I, I don't know what's up with KLM. They just sent us, like, literally just before we started recording <laughs> on our <laughs> Twitter, on Layover's Twitter, a DM, like, how would you rate uh, KLM social media? What, 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 what is that? That <laughs> It really means that it's a robot doing that. Yeah, it does. And, yeah, because I don't think that we've ever, I don't even know if we've mentioned them in the last several months that would prompt uh, an intervention like that. It was bizarre. <laughs> it's totally bizarre. I think... I retweeted one comment from someone who had the word KLM, but if that's enough to trigger, like, how do we do on social media, that's that's really not really good. No, no, not at all. Especially if there was no, like, back and forth between one party and KLM, which there wasn't. Yeah, well, there you go. A few corrections before we get into the meat of the, the program. One was, I said in the last episode, because I didn't have the notes in front of me, that part of the Museum of Boeing was closing at Painfield. It's actually the Future of Flight Aviation Center, which is run by the Institute of Flight, which is a part only of the full exhibition that is closing. You've been there recently. You actually told me you even sat in the uh, the nose of that uh, 727 by FedEx. Yeah, that, that, they're, that they're trying to sell. And actually, you could feel, now that you mentioned it, you could feel in the main exhibition hall there were a lot of um, empty spaces where exhibitions had clearly been and things that weren't open and unmanned so now that we've discovered that it's it's closing that makes a lot of sense and as you say you can at least i still think it's up for sale that uh, fedex 727 it's just the front part of it uh, you can actually still buy it <laughs> for super cheap, but transportation costs, obviously. Uh, it's not like Amazon Prime. You don't get delivered for free at home. Um, so maybe you're interested. Or you can even buy uh, a 90% scale model of a Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 engine, which is the one that they have so many issues with. <laughs> and they, that is there. I remember standing in front of that. I didn't know it was 90%. It's still gargantuan. Maybe maybe it is, they just, just use that instead of canceling all these uh, 787 routes. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that issue Talking seems about- to be getting worse anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talking about 90%, I went to see um, the closing concert of the live tour of Iron Maiden. Mm. The reason I mentioned that is that they had a 90% Spitfire, a full replica on stage at the opening. I mean, we know that the singer Bruce Dickinson is himself an airline pilot. He has Cardiff Aviation as well, which does maintenance. He also had uh, some point, I don't know if it's still up, 
uh, JV in Djibouti, I think. So he does a lot of stuff with aviation. We always said that we were going to try to have him one day on the show. Not sure if I can pull that one off. But so that was really cool to see. And it's a faithfully recreated plane. It's 90% just because they couldn't fit in on every single stage they were going to during that world tour. But it's really amazing to see such a thing. And it moves around as well. It's just, just not static or like it comes from the sky or something. It's really... A bl- That's so cool. <laughs> and it's so obvious. When you, when you have something like that, you are a bona fide airplane nerd. <laughs> Actually, if you're interested, we do not cover warplanes, of course, here on this show. But if you're interested, Bruce Dickinson is currently hosting a 10-episode weekly YouTube video. I think it's called Wargaming. That's the name of the channel. It's free, obviously. And he, he talks about different aircrafts, uh, different warplanes. He's really a buff. He knows a lot of stuff about these things. So it's pretty cool to see if you're interested in in uh, World War II fighters or the Spitfire, the Hawker Hurricane, the Messerschmitt 109 and stuff like that. You should clearly take a look at Wargaming on uh, YouTube. Again, sent us a news. He sent us that uh, a lot of other people sent us. There was an interesting article on Quartz about airplane seats. And the only one thing that I'm going to quote about this article, because otherwise you can just look it up, guys, is that the reason that seats are blue is because blue is serene. I don't buy that. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. I mean, if that were the case, then almost everybody would have them. I think that that's... Eh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It is, and yes, that may be the case, but, you know... I don't think it's going to change the overall mood of a of the inside of an airplane. Was Alaska blue? Uh, gray. The, at least the first. I didn't actually look back in economy, but the the first class seats were were gray leather slash pleather. Okay, so that's so that's why you had like this angry vomit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys got no, the episode. It wasn't that bad. It was just, no, no. We won't, we won't pick that scab anymore. <laughs> uh, so that trend we mentioned in our few uh, past episodes about people taking uh, pictures of themselves, of I mean, of their phone, listening to our show has been kind of picking up. I had like at least, I think, three. One is from uh, Shane O'Neill on Twitter. He says, listening and photographing on the way to Adelaide. Hashtag always window. I love that. Nice. Uh, and he, he's probably like just above the wings. It's pretty cool. Another one is Max IDID, I guess, uh, or Max I did. Listening to Layovers podcast on my way to Hong Kong. Hashtag Swiss first. And yeah, he's in first class. And that's an iPad. He's photographing his own iPad. And I've never done Swiss first class. And it looks really awesome. And I really want to do this. We're very jealous, Max, yeah. assuming that your name is Max. And Sunil, our friend Sunil, layovers during a layover, and he sends us a picture of his laptop with our website, which I haven't updated in forever, which I'll do. I promise Sunil I will do the show notes. As soon as I come back from my trip, I will get onto that. And also his phone listening to our Seattle episode of 76. So thank you, guys. That's really, it's really cool to see actually our our show being not only listened, but also in pictures. Yeah. So thank you so much. We really do appreciate that. I like that. this trend. Uh, Dan Tan Dan, who is a resident of Melbourne, if I'm not uh, mistaken, has uh, reacted to our story about the cello because he is himself an artist. He actually plays instruments. And he ah. says that having a cello on board is always a mixed bag, which obviously, because it's such a huge instrument, that he basically says you're never completely sure when you're going to get, even if you do everything right. So you warn the airline, you buy the extra seat, the aircraft has the right regulation for you to carry it. Sometimes you still might have issues. That doesn't, for me, excuse the attitude and how it was dealt with, but it's, no. I'm sure that, of course, such a big like uh, carry-on <laughs> will raise sometimes issues. So uh, I've retweeted the tweet on our layovers account. If you want to read his, his account of what it takes to actually bring a shallow on board, it's quite interesting. So and we're very happy to have someone who's an artist at the same time being listened to our show. So thank you, Dan. We really yeah. appreciate that a lot. <laughs> So the Terminator-style type of recording we're doing, I don't know who's Sarah Connor and who's... Maybe... No, actually, I'm the old one. So I'm the... Alex is the T... What was it? Thousand. So he's a fluid guy. We can do whatever. And I'm the <laughs> old... <laughs> Well, that, that kind of caught us because we released the episode about Seattle on Saturday, 10th, 11th, I don't know, 11th, I think. And well, purely coincidentally, that was the same day that crazy, crazy story happened at SeaTac of that airline employee basically stealing an aircraft. 
Yeah, it really is the most extraordinary story. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I don't actually know how I feel about it. Because, yes, it's bizarre. Yes, it's extraordinary in so many things. And we can rehash the details shortly. But the chap that did it was obviously at the end of his tether. He was he was a, he was a troubled soul. Uh, and this was his sort of cry for help that ended in his, you know, in his death, sadly. So while it is a bizarre and incredible story, it's also very sad at the same time so i've kind of been looking at this from a an aviation perspective a holy crap perspective and a that's just damn sad perspective but yeah he he was a baggage handler or, or yeah he was a baggage handler i don't think he had any any other role like a ramp operator tug operator anything like that but he stole a q400 uh, from horizon part of alaska and powered it up taxied it, took it off, and went on a joyride, all the time talking to air traffic control, who were calmly trying to suggest that he land, and he was very kind of, I don't know, sanguine about the whole thing, and just said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I want to land, I, 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 I know what will happen if I do, and I'm not really prepared to do that, and he did the most extraordinary maneuvers, no one is quite sure if they were intentional or or unintentional, but he he did a full barrel roll with the thing. It's insane. Which there's video of. And he comes out of a dive, maybe. Uh, it's hard to tell from the perspective of the video, but it looks, you know, less than 100 feet from the from the water surrounding Seattle. And eventually he, he crashed on an island to the south of Seattle. And mercifully, in a way, no one else was hurt or killed. He was. But it it's it's the most extraordinary story I don't think I've I've heard anything like this. I know that there are people who have tried to steal airplanes, and some have stolen, you know, light aircraft, but but nothing of this magnitude that I can recall. The few the few incidents that have been with purposely, although in that case we're not sure, crashing an aircraft were all pilots. You've been the German wings, obviously, the uh, Egypt. Again, Egypt always uh, said that it wasn't the case, but I mean, most everybody else agrees that it was like an in- intentional crash. There's been a few others, but never. I mean, there's been so much commentary about should we enhance security at airports, and I'm like, you know, like like you say, he's, he's, he was a he's a lone soul. We don't know, of course, the background, probably mental health issues. Yeah, it was not an act of terrorism because otherwise he would have crashed a thing over like you know houses or like the airport or something. Actually, they even scrambled jets, I think. You know, yeah, they did. They to... they scrambled too. Uh, there's some footage of that as well, and they didn't shoot it down. I don't even know if they got there in time. I think it was no ill intent. Of, no, of course, there's some kind of ill intent to stealing an aircraft, but I mean, there was no trying to harm people or whatever. It just it was a joy ride. I'm not. We're not saying it's a good thing, but so. Then would you like make life so much harder for everybody else in airports? Uh, I mean, I'm talking here about you know people that work at airports. Because of that, I'm not sure. I mean, no. at the end of the day, there's been uh, through the various press uh, releases and press conferences. They said, you know, we did all the background checks and the background checks, everything cleared out. There's only so far you can go, right? And uh, yeah. it's still sad. I mean, uh, of course, the, the, the images are, are insane because we both, I mean, you woke up with this. Uh, for me, it was maybe in the middle of the afternoon and I was like, well, what's going on? Like a guy yeah. just stole an aircraft? Like a Q400? I was like, what? Yeah. How do you? How do you? It, 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 again, like, I, I still don't know how to feel about this. It, it But, I mean, there was a commentary on Reddit in the aviation thread. You know, people are like, how, how the heck did he manage to do all these maneuvers with the with the Q400? But that plane has 10,000 horsepower. And when it's empty, the power to rate ratio is the same as a combat loaded P-51. Wow. So, oh, wow. So that, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by that. That's It's, it's a good airplane. Structurally, it probably wouldn't have been in the best condition when it was if it had been recovered but obviously it 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 wasn't recovered the whole thing is tragic i think it just comes back to the whole mental health issues in and around the industry you know that as you said the german wings things was crash was a mental health issue the the security and access to the plane thing i think will go away quickly when we realize how bizarre an occurrence this was and it's not something that that will likely be be repeated the circumstances that needed to come together for this to happen you know someone with clearance and access to the airplane and with the knowledge and that's still an open question mark how did he acquire the, the knowledge to to start taxi maneuver the airplane etc is so rare but it it doesn't take away from the fact that 
you know, perhaps this isn't an industry that needs to place more emphasis on the on the mental health of the people that that make it work. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll we'll obviously learn, though. I'm not sure because you know they recover the black boxes and everything. I'm not sure we're gonna learn a lot more because at the end of the day, there was a discussion. Everything was actually you could hear the ATC. The, the files are up there, guys. If you're interested, the professionalism of the tower is actually really really good. I mean, they, they were are amazing. At first, you know, they're a bit startled. They say, what are you doing? And, you know, because they start talking about him when he's on the runway. And he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing there? And then they're talking, you know, they're trying to find a way to say, hey, you know, at least here, stay there and we'll clear the airspace for you. And why don't you do this? It was never aggression. Yeah. It was trying to be polite and try to calm him down. Although he didn't seem particularly angry or anything. No, he, it just did, seemed like he seemed so calm and just sort of, again, like at the end, it was like a, a an aerial version of the movie falling down. You know, the, oh, he yeah. was just, yeah. he was just done. He was just done with everything. And, you know, that's, that's what makes this, this tragedy even more tragic. I think that, yeah. you know, this was a guy that he was just done. And, and you're right. The, the professionalism of the air traffic controllers in a once in a lifetime situation should be and i think has been generally commended because what the hell are they going to do there's a dude flying around they have no idea what's going to happen they have no idea what his intentions are and they tried to talk him down and unfortunately maybe he was going to eventually but he i don't know if he intentionally yeah that's a crashed or and i think that's probably what may be the cockpit voice recorder if he's sort of if he's saying anything out loud, might reveal. But until then, I think it's it, it's a it's a bizarre and and sad incident. Yeah. Anyway, moving on, uh, we'll learn more. I'm not sure. Like, there's a lot to learn, but I also agree with you wholeheartedly. It's probably a one in a trillion, you know, occurrence. It's not something that will change the face of the airline industry, no. but it's still a very sad event. Uh, we had also a message from Hanita, who actually corrected herself. The airport she was talking about in the last episode, and we said H-A-G, it's H-A-J, and that's Hanover Airport. <laughs> so there you ah. go, we didn't know what the airport we were talking about. She thanks us for the shout out. She said, incidentally, just a, a day after she got out of there, they had to close the airport down because the runway had melted. Uh, <laughs> she so, so much heat in, in Europe currently. But she says, skip this airport in your travels. She didn't seem to like it a lot. It's not a very big airport. It's like 5 million passengers a year or something. I'm not sure we're going to ever cover it, but you never know. You know, maybe one day we'll have something that drives us there. And, you know, Hanover seems like a nice city. So maybe we'll do once. Yeah. Uh, still in Germany... Since we're talking about security, but this time, of course, passenger security, uh, we mentioned in the last episode that we wanted to talk a little bit about TSA. So I'll start with some stuff in Europe and then we'll move to the US. Uh, there's been, and that's crazy because Frankfurt always in the headlines for the wrong stuff. Frankfurt had to be evacuated because a French family got past security despite getting a positive test for explosives. Jeez. So how does that happen? So you get swiped. It says positive, and then they tell you, oh, you can go. And then when, how do they realize their mistake? That, I don't, do, how does that happen? That's what I was just wondering. At what point did they go, wait a minute, was it a handoff? Did someone say, oh, you know, hold them, they need additional screening while I go and get this, and then they perhaps misunderstood and and gathered their things and went on their way? And why did they test positive for explosives? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently when they were found later, they were retested or maybe like enhanced testing and everything was fine. Yeah. It's just that in our experiences of clearing these type of swipes, which don't always happen, sometimes they're random, etc. Yeah. But if you have something, they just not let you go. They just, you know, do. I mean, I don't know. They enhance it, maybe a pat down. I don't know something. Mm. It seems a bit strange that they would have let these people. An entire family, by the way. It's not even like a single person. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, just uh, I'm not saying here anything. But at the same time, how I dislike security at Frankfurt. Well, there you go. They also, not only they are rude, but also they are not really professional. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, I'm transiting there tomorrow, which I'm not looking forward. Uh, I'll tell that the story about that in our next episode. Um, Berlin, Schoenfeld <laughs> also had to be evacuated. Also the security area, but this time they didn't understand what they saw. It was a sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> that, I feel like that's not the first time that this has happened. This proves they have impenetrable security. 
<laughs> Zing. <laughs> Zing. Uh, another story still in the German-speaking part of Europe in Vienna this time. This is a bit of an older story, but I found it completely insane. This was this young 24-year-old uh, American woman that found, uh, the article said, an explosive grenade. I think it was a 75 millimeter tank shell probably uh, when she was like hiking in uh, Austria uh, she decided to take it as a souvenir she took it back to the hotel she cleaned it for crying out loud she cleaned it she put it in her carry-on and then she went to Vienna and tried to pass security which of course like lit up all the light bulbs you can imagine and all the alarms you can imagine and they had to evacuate the airport because somebody had brought like a tank shell in the Jeez, airport I mean way. how how do you decide to find, you know, it's a pretty big thing, by the way, a 75 millimeter tank shell, artillery yeah. tank shell. It's How do you just decide to bring it home? I don't, I just don't. How did that. she not blow herself up? <laughs> exactly. That's oh in that process. Oh my God. Uh, they, they, of course, they sent, you know, the special team, whatever, SWAT and stuff, mm -hmm. and they r removed it and everything was fine. But still, my God, I mean. <laughs> Sometimes and I'm like sometimes like anxious of security because like I don't know podcasting equipment. Well, clearly I shouldn't be because I don't have a grenade in my carry on or something. <laughs> so you, you you mentioned last time in the US that you had uh, TSA pre. Uh, mm. Have you ever tried or considered or do you know about clear TSA clear? Do you know it? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't tried it. And actually, I don't know if anybody else has, that I know has tried it either. It looks like a private thing. I mean, it's endorsed by the TSA, otherwise you wouldn't get past security. It's only available in selected airports, quite a lot, but not everywhere, obviously. And it's, uh, it's a pass that you pay. You pay a membership, you get cleared, interviews and security and everything. And then you also have that similar type of experience when you're getting fast track, no need to remove liquids and stuff. I, I, that's what I, I hear. I, I was just curious because I've heard a few friends mention it to me last week. It's not open. I think it's only open for U.S. citizens or residents yeah. and be able to get it. It's the second incarnation of it because the first incarnation went bankrupt. What? And, <laughs> and then, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, and, and, and then it relaunched in just a handful of airports and San Francisco was one of them. But I never see anybody going through that channel compared to TSA Pre. I think what you're seeing now is just a reduced version of, of this original idea. But with TSA Pre, I'm not sure why you would need that as well. Yeah, that's exactly the way I was thinking. I'm like, if you already qualify for TSA Pre, what would Clear give you on top of it? I, I, I'm actually really not sure. Maybe anyone who has one or both can let us know on Twitter or on Facebook Messenger or something about what is the difference and if is that actually good. I don't even remember if TSA Pre is open to non-US residents and non-US yes, uh, nationals. It, yeah, it, it is because BA have started oh. offering it now. Oh, okay. Well, uh, good thing. Well, and here, I think I've, we've talked about this in the past that if yeah, a non-US citizen is traveling on the same reservation as a US citizen that has TSA pre, that person will also get TSA pre. I need to travel with you more, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another interesting and welcoming piece of news about US entry is that San Jose Airport, which you know quite well, actually, is introducing biometric gates uh, for international passengers. So soon enough, you'll be able to enter San Jose with a biometric passport I still think you have to fill the ESTA and whatever, but it will fast track a little bit this entire ordeal. So it's a, yeah. that's good news. I think that's it is. News. I think that, I think they're anticipating continued growth at that airport. And while it, it's now a joy to get through, I think you add one or two more flights during the day and it won't be. So TSA, they, uh, we had this piece of news and then it changed during the week since we recorded last week, but I'm still going to mention it. TSA was thinking about abandoning security in the smaller airports of the U.S., they said, you know what, any airport that carries aircraft that are no more, I think it was 60 passengers per aircraft, will stop doing security. Yeah. Which, uh, since then, they abandoned it because it was an outcry. But I was wondering, so what happens? So you get into the aircraft, you know, without any type of security, then you will need to install a TSA transfer security at the main airports. That becomes yeah. even more security. I mean, we experienced that in Europe. We mentioned just Frankfurt. You have sometimes, it's a bit of a lottery. Some airports, you seem to be going from one gate to the other without any security. And some airports in Europe, you need to. But that would have created that kind of ordeal in the US. And it would have been really bad, I think. Yeah, it would have been. Because transiting through US airports, especially if you've come from international, which I know probably wouldn't apply in this instance, but 
is is a nightmare. So in a way, I'm glad that they've they've stepped back. They're just trying to cut costs, and this seemed like a slightly overly aggressive way of doing it. They also say that they're not going to change the liquid uh, size. I think it's uh, what 3.4 ounces. So that's the 100 yeah. mil in Europe. They don't see why they would change it. We still don't know why they chose it. Maybe because it's a brown number or something. Yeah, <laughs> totally <laughs> they, arbitrary. <laughs> But I mean, I can understand why they thought about doing this policy of reducing or removing security in smaller airports, because they say that 30 of the busiest airports in the US account for more than 70% of TSA's work. So that's really where they actually do most of the grunt of the work into the big airports. And the smaller ones are just maybe even money losers. Very possible. uh, But I mean, it's security. I mean, you're not supposed to make money out of security. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's bizarre. It's just, they also announced they will en- enhance the canine capacities. You'll see a lot of dogs now, and uh, and I hope that uh, United doesn't kill them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the TSA seems also to be going quite scot free because there's been a federal appeals court in Philadelphia that has basically said that, well, TSA screeners are not technically law enforcement officers. So they enjoy sovereign immunity. So they can do whatever the hell they want. It's an overreach, I think. I mean, I don't know. Is TSA, I'm not sure, private or public? It's public, but it's um, often the work is done by private contractors in many, but not all airports in the U.S. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, San so, so Francisco has, a, yeah. not even TSA, has something else even, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're independent. And uh, with the worst of the worst, which led to a lot of outcry, is apparently TSA is running their own surveillance program. So if you're not on any of the FBI lists or CIA lists or terrorist lists or whatever list that gets you like to be declined of traveling or having hands, you know, pad downs or whatever... They've started a program called Quiet Skies. The Boston Globe has unveiled, has found after an investigation, this story. So no any investigation by no U.S. agency. You might still have hence surveillance by the TSA. You don't know why, but you might. So I'm not sure what the hell is going on here. But <laughs> that, Yeah, I mean, that breaks so many U.S. laws that it's insane. Not that that seems to make any difference these days, but... Uh, <laughs> There's been quite, quite, quite a big outcry about this, and I don't know what's going to happen unless I've missed something. There doesn't seem to have been any recourse so far, but it's horrendous. <laughs> it's absolutely horrendous that they're that they're doing this. And you know, the Boston Globe did a great job. It's a pretty harrowing investigative report that's worth reading if you travel even a, a small amount. Uh, I've never gotten even the the quadruple S. Uh, now that I say this, of course, uh, the NSA yeah. will pick that up on our podcast. And next time I fly to New York, I will have it. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, a listener, and I don't have his name or her name in front of me, and I'm sorry for that, sent us a picture of a Burbank uh, airport in California. I think we talked about it. Did we even have an episode about it? I don't remember. Yeah, I was just there the other day. The picture is really cool because it's obviously to our never-ending story about smart carry-ons, and it's pretty cool. It's American. There's a luggage, and it just says, are there USB power ports and or lights anywhere in the bag? Well, that's a smart bag. You're declined. You cannot go with it. <laughs> I'll just... Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, American, we- I think, have been really aggressive about this. They realize the potential danger as well. And I've seen that's the most explicit language, not not in a sort of sweary way, but in the in the there's no bones about this way of all the signage that I've seen for smart bags. And I think that that's that's a good thing because they're just they're dangerous and they're stupid. What were you doing at Burbank? Did you not drive to come we, to We did, LA? but we took the kids to Universal <laughs> Studios, and that's very near Burbank uh-huh. Airport. And the hotel that we were staying at overlooked Burbank Airport. By pure coincidence, of but, You know what? Fu- weirdly enough, yes, <laughs> by coincidence. Uh, it's a neat little airport. I've been there before. I've flown there before. Uh, so I, I, like, uh, I like going in and out of there. <laughs> You went to Simpsons World. I'm very jealous of you. How was that? It was great. It was great. That's the leverage that was used to get me to go to Universal Studios. It was it was neat. I had a crusty burger. I had Duff beer. I had a squishy. <laughs> I went to the Quickie Mart. I went to Moe's. You know, it was good. It was fun. If you're a Simpsons fan, it's um, it's probably worth making the pilgrimage. I'll definitely do that next time I'm in the region. My God, I was so jealous. You were putting a few pictures online, then you sent me a sum, and I was like, "What, Christmas burgers? <laughs> really?" <laughs> Very jealous. Oh, so back to smart bags. You remember Remoa had started this uh, bag which had like a electronic tag on it. Yeah. And that was supposed to be with Lufthansa. And at some point, they even said that we are onboarding 10 other airlines, which were never qualified. Well, 
Rimova just decided to give up and they're stopping this, which is a good thing, I think. Yeah, I, I think it is too. I, it just seemed like a, a, a solution in search of a problem. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Guys in the lab thinking, oh, this is really cool. Yeah, well, it is. And to be honest, when I looked at it, I said, yeah, this is really cool. Then I said, will I actually use it? No, and it's actually more complicated than anything. And I'm not even thinking about what happens when the battery runs out and your tag doesn't even appear and your bag is lost forever. I yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sure that all these smart bag companies know that their days are numbered now because I keep seeing a lot of ads on my Instagram and Facebook feeds about those. And the latest one is this uh, uh, <laughs> luggage that follows you like a robot, like a pet, which is what that. I mean, what, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. You well, know, why? I, I, why? Yeah, it's infu- the whole thing is infuriating. Well, the, the good news, because a lot of people have been sending us that, is that uh, airports are thinking about going security less. I don't believe a word of it, but they are trialing, I think, both at JFK and at Heathrow, the scanners that surround you all the time in the airport. They have 3D imagery. They can detect if you have explosives or anything suspicious as soon as you enter the airport. They promise, which again, I don't believe that one day we'll just enter. I mean, of course, it's possible, but I still think that airports kind of like reassuring their passengers by having this checkpoint, don't you think? Yeah, security theater and all that. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I don't think there's any harm in having that technology in the airport anyway. And if they if they can expedite the screening that they that we all go through because they have this this secondary technology all around us, that's that's fine too. That would that would be great actually. I'm sure that where it actually could really be positive for us is that if there's 3D imagery, it could lead that we never have to remove anything from our carry-ons or nice. our bags anymore because it can 3D scan the thing and say, oh, because one of the reasons that they make you remove your laptops is because that flat surface with all electronics that basically obscures everything that's under or above it so by removing it it just makes it simpler to actually read what it's on the bag Mm -hmm. whereas if you had like 3d imagery maybe they can just go below it without having to ask to remove it or something i'm I'm sure there's that could be a good thing in the end I, i i really do hope so because that's really a pain still security in every in every airport. Why don't we live back in the seventies when such a thing didn't exist? Yeah, uh, <laughs> those were really not happy. Are the people? I don't know if you've read because you, you're in California right now. The people trying to enter the UK, the hours to get into the UK. I mean, unless you have, of course, biometric passport, which means EU citizen at least until Brexit. Well, then you have to wait until like what three, four hours to get clear to enter the UK. This is really a nightmare. This seems to happen every summer. Yeah, I don't know. It's just staffing issues, I guess, or something. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I know that the airlines have lodged formal complaints with the yep. uh, with the border force in the UK to to sort this out. But I'm bracing myself for a long wait because because I have kids, I can't go through the oh, e gates. Yeah. So there's a oh my god, and, and they have two people usually at, at best to manage a very long queue of people, all like us that have got kids who are pissed off after a long flight. Mm-hmm. So I'm bracing myself for um, <laughs> a, a pretty unpleasant experience when we get back to to Heathrow. And you said I think uh, IAG chiefs of BAs put a complaint, but also Virgin Atlantic did the same, and I'm sure others. I mean, I mean, four hours. You know, I've been in bad airports too. You expect sometimes at JFK now, though it's getting much better in some other airports. But four hours? Ridiculous. I've never experienced four hours to enter any country in the world. Even even Beirut, which is really one of the worst experience when you are not first in line. I mean, it was like maybe like an hour and a half, and it was already like, this is way too long, but never four hours. That would just drive me nuts. Absolutely nuts. Uh, I, when I was in, in Taipei and also in Narita, I remember in both cases, my plane, so the one in Taipei, I reboarded it to go to Manila, and the Delta flight that went to Narita was continuing to Honolulu, which is our airport of the day. And you have to go to a, a security. Of course, I didn't have to do the one to Honolulu because it was stopping in Narita, but it was very striking. In Taipei, there were at least 12 ground staff shouting with big signs where you were supposed to go because they didn't want, of course, passengers to just stay in Taipei. So you're like, you have to go over there, over there, over there. In Narita, they had a single person which was bowing with a sign. And I was like, which one is more civilized? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, all that to talk about China a little bit. Uh, it's a bit political, but we cannot not talk about it. Have you seen that uh, China, so mainland China, is forcing airlines in the world to change the mapping about Taiwan? Also, like, of course, Hong Kong and Macau to a certain extent. They shouldn't be in different colors. Taiwan should be actually labeled China Taiwan. All that to kind of hint that all this is one country. And the airlines just said that, yeah, we'll abide because I guess they don't want to have any retaliation. I think Crazy. specifically they're referring to the to the IFE maps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the the ones that are their customer facing. It uh, you know it is what it is. I. I I have an opinion on this, but I'm not. I'm not even going to go there. No, me, me too, because we're avoiding politics here uh, to a certain extent. We cannot always, but it's uh, well, it's the power of China. Uh, China loves the number eight, so the eight, eight, eight of August, twenty eighteen, as well. Both uh, Air China and uh, Citroen Airlines received their first three fifty. Have you seen uh, how the uh, Citroen Airlines livery really is? It's really, really fun with a big panda on it. It's really cute. <laughs> yeah, because when, cute is the when right I word. Compare it to, I don't know what you think about the one from Air China. It seems like they've been stuck in the 70s. I it's know. really. <laughs> why? I mean, I, I get it. State owned. Is it still state owned? I'm not even sure. But just do something a little bit more sexy. Yeah. Air China. It, it's funny. Most of the. A lot of the newer Chinese airlines have, have, are a little bit more ostentatious with their liveries. They're, again, they're not hugely imaginative, but China Eastern. China Airlines, they're all awful. No, pardon me, Air China and China Eastern. And then China Airlines is beautiful. It's got the, the chrysanthemum yeah, yeah. flower on the back and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. They can make a brand new airplane look 40 years old with that. <laughs> exactly. I was looking at the 350 and was like, this looks like the picture from 1981 or something. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't understand. <laughs> anyway, back to uh, the last bit of my flight. So I left you guys when I was in Narita. I went to Haneda, I had, you know, highballs and did some stuff in the between because I had nine hours in between. Uh, <laughs> that was really fun. People ask me twice the same question. How do I deal with luggage in Japan? Japan has lockers everywhere, guys. Yeah. This is so... Gr I mean, I know that all countries have removed lockers because of terrorist concerns, and I get it. But come on, it's so amazing to be able to leave your luggage in a locker and just to walk around free. And it's not only the airports and train stations and subway stations and everywhere. It's a boon to be able to do that and not carrying all your stuff around. I mean, I really wish that other... I mean, in some airports, we have like these manned luggage... Like, I think even Heathrow has, they even, like, pass your luggage through an x-ray machine or something, like, similar as you were to board an aircraft. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they did. They've done it in Hong Kong many times, and that's exactly what they do. And in the U.S. Yeah, oh, even in the U.S. Well, I didn't know. But why yeah. would you leave your luggage at JFK? That's beyond me now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how did that security was... Uh, blazing fast and i went this time because it was flying air france i went to the jal lounge and not the a a one which i did last time it's a fantastic fantastic lounge all the lounges i don't know if you've seen so you just released uh, an episode of attache the one on uh, oslo which is really good by the Thank way I, I encourage people to watch it and every time i watch something on youtube these days on a pre-roll i get an ad from jal <laughs> really? and it's uh, maybe because you don't have it because it's only a uk campaign but it's very sleek. It shows like a sushi chef doing sushis and everything is so minimalistic and so well. And it, it just suffuses the brand of being, you know, simple but diligent. It's perfect. It's really fantastic. This is exactly how I felt in the lounge. Everything has like a clear wood and it's very well thought out. It's one of the best lounges I've seen. Really, really, really. And I also took a shower. So remember last time I took a shower at ANA and ANA had to give my passport. But this time I didn't have to give the passport. What they do, they give you this, you know, like in these restaurants, they give you this thing that starts ringing when your food is ready yeah so they give you the same thing for when the shower is ready only that you know japanese being japanese pardon me if i'm not pc here the thing starts ringing like mad in the middle of a very quiet lounge and you cannot turn it off because oh. they really want you not to miss your spot for the shower so you get fully stressed out i'm like Shh, no i can't need to get to the shower and i was running and this thing everybody was looking at me because the thing was just beeping beeping like crazy that's <laughs> yeah, I, I I like that lounge. I think it's a great lounge. It's um, as you say, it's very elegant and very calm and peaceful. 
great view of the of the apron as well. Peaceful, I think, is a perfect word. It's very peaceful, which again shows that this beeping thing was really not the best yeah. thing. To... <laughs> but, yeah, if you ever hit that lounge, guys, the second floor is usually completely empty because people just seem not to see that there's a second floor. Uh, there's also uh, food and you know these beer dispensers and stuff. That's so really cool. You should actually go. Uh, which actually made me think. You remember I, I told you that that's A and A. So that's back to the earlier story that I told a few episodes ago. A and A has on their bathrooms they have a male, a female, and now they have a tail fin with the rainbow. Yes. Yeah, which I read about, and that's what we both assumed is it's uh, transgender friendly. Yeah. It just says uh, you can come into that bathroom. So I thought it's, a, it's small, you know, it just sits there, but I think it's a very welcoming. And I, I learned that ANA since 2016 has done initiatives like that for their staff, for the passengers to make everybody comfortable, which, uh, which is, I'm not saying surprising, which is really, I've not heard a lot of other airlines who will be no. as forward about doing that kind of things. And I thought it's pretty It's pretty great. Good. It's fantastic, especially in a country that struggles sometimes with its, um, yeah. how that all fits into its society. Society. Massive kudos to them for, for being leaders on that. Yeah, absolutely. So Air France. Air France feels like uh, flying um, Emirates after you've flown Delta and KLM, trust me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, blue seats still, and these are the it's dark blue. I'm not, again, a fan, but, you know, they have the similar seats that you have on Cathay or Finnair. Not as many bells and whistles as Cathay, because Cathay has a custom versions, but probably closer than to Finnair. You've flown the 350 yourself. So this type of seat's really nice. Lots of room for my feet, I'm told. Again, it was perfect. AFE is great. What I love about French is a French touch. Of course, I speak French, so maybe my experience is biased, because I will talk to the crew in French. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's the, the safety video, and it's probably online, guys. Look at it. It's so fun, because it's so French. So it looks like a fashion show and they when you put your your safety vest it's, then they say oh it will look great on your figure you know like yeah, yeah. And everything and it's, <laughs> they really make everything sound super sexy you know and romantic it's it's a great it's it's a great uh, safety video maybe not as great as the lego one because it's not fun in that in that respect but it's really good i'm sure it's available online you should absolutely absolutely uh, yeah i need to go watch it. that i haven't seen that one yet <laughs> it's really really, really good the food was fantastic you know of course it's french food i said i was not in first so i didn't have the robuchon menu but still really fantastic it was the same service i used to do when i was to live in japan back then air france was departing from Nar narita now from haneda that's the only difference so that's the one that departs at like probably around 11 p.m and lands the first flight in paris charles de gaulle which when on the PA they say, oh, we'll be a little bit in advance on our time, I'm like, oh, no. Because basically arriving too early in Paris means that nobody has started working and the airport is closed. And I had memories of <laughs> me 10 years ago when I could literally see the staff installing themselves quietly, seeing us behind a glass pane door and not hurrying up because we were there. And I'm like, no, no, why are we in oh, advance? No, no, please slow the plane down or something. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so it's really fantastic flight. It's not Emirates, of course. It's not Cathay, but it's really a notch above. It's really a great product. Apparently, everybody says that uh, first class on Air France is probably the best in the world right now. I don't know. I've never experienced wow. it. There's no door, but they have... It's clever, actually. But you have a curtain. You're secluded as well. The food is apparently the best you can have in an aircraft. I, of course, again, when you compare to you know Singapore and Cathay and all this, probably they all are very close to each other. But yeah. a lot of people say that currently it's probably the best. It's really hard to find, though. The, the, you know, the availability on our tickets for Air France First is not really easy. And they try, I guess, to limit that to people who actually pay for it. Yeah, yeah no, so. fair enough. Really, Air France, I still like them. They're losing a lot of money, which is bad. So I'm not sure they can continue like <laughs> like this. But I really did enjoy my flight. One quirk about Air France, you know, like on the seating plan, usually you have A, B, C, D, e, F, and etc. So usually on one side you have A, and it usually ends with K, right? Yeah. That's the last. On Air France, it ends with L. And hmm. I was like, mm hmm. And actually, I realized that they do A, B, C, E, F, G, H, JKL because they consider that the L is a seat. So D for them 
is the ale and uh, i is the ale so that they finish at l and of course when you, they reduce the number of seats going uh, in front of the aircraft you have only best for instance like a e f l so that's a one two one it's it's a bit strange because on my maps you know i keep like a diagram of my maps uh, where i sat and this always is completely odd the l thing <laughs> i don't yeah. know of any other it screws everything up <laughs> <laughs> your, your brother so when i arrived in, in charles de gaulle I, I arrived thank god at t2 but your brother uh, will uh, sent us a picture of his own arrival at charles de gaulle which was the episode of two episodes ago guys it looks like a shitty logan's run yeah <laughs> <laughs> it does. That's that's kind of, I, and of course, if you've been there, you know exactly what he's talking about with this this dome with all of the uh, the they're not escalators because they're 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 stepless. Flat. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, stepless. Yeah, they are like I don't know how you the, call the, them. Actually. The travelator thingies, but they're at an angle, as Paul mentioned in two episodes ago. And yeah, <laughs> he didn't have a fun experience there. No, everything is cramped. I mean, again, T two is slightly better, but again, we arrive. We're the first flight landing. Clearly. Oh wow. First flight landing, which always is the case. That's the first flight landing. It was like 4 a.m. And, of course, the, we had to wait because the staff was not ready in the airport. But that was not as long as it used to be. So maybe they bettered the game. But So I had three hours to kill because then I was transitioning to a BA flight to go back to London. And literally, I'm alone in the airport. The airport clearly starts really kind of working 5.36 a.m. Mm-hmm. So from 4 to let's say at least 5.30. I literally, and I have pictures, I have the entire terminal for myself. Airside or landside? So I did what I told you guys. I went out because I was into E and I walked to to C, which is where I was uh, taking a BA. So then I was landside and then I went back airside, but alone. The first flights are leaving later than, for instance, in uh, London, we have a lot of flights leaving at 6. The first flights leave mostly at 7.30 and later. So literally no one would actually come you know, at 5.30. There's no point. And so I was literally alone. It's really strange That's to see an aircraft. They wouldn't open any of the, um, you know, no shops. I couldn't find a coffee. There was not a lot of vending machines. Oh, my God. I mean, it, it was fun because I took a lot of pictures because it's great to being able to witness an airport completely empty. Yeah, felt, that unusual. felt like Logan's Run, actually. Isn't the plot of Logan's Run like the end of civilization or something? Yeah, no old people are allowed and all that. Yeah, that's, that's a bit what I experienced up. <laughs> so, Will, you see, you were absolutely right about the, <laughs> the thing. Uh, I remember you had a tweet a few, maybe even a month ago now. That was a very popular tweet of yours when you said, uh, business people doing businessy things in lounges and being oh, very yeah. loud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It does drive me slightly crazy with lots of lots of loud, usually fat white dudes marching <laughs> around the lounge on a on a headset um, shouting into their phones about business things. It's it's very rude. <laughs> So I was in the Air France lounge to wait for one of my flights. It's not the B one is previously, but still, it's a fun story. And the, they they had this um, <laughs> they had this section for VIPs. So it's yeah, I guess it were people flying first or something. I'm not mm. sure. Like there was literally no one. Then this very important person arrives. And he's shouting on his phone and like, oh, my God, you know, like really no, doesn't care, whatever. And then that's the funny bit. Then clearly falls asleep and starts snoring like hell in the entire lot. So it was really fun because all of us were looking at each other and say, okay, so that must be like some kind of CEO. And the old thing he does is snoring like I've never heard. <laughs> that was oh, fun. no. <laughs> and Air France still does announcements in their lounge on the PA, and they do it super loud. I'm not used to that anymore. We don't hear. I was going to say that's quite unusual, isn't it? And even mm-hmm. even entire airports are going going that way. No announcements. I remember the first airports that started this trend were probably in the Nordics, uh, Scandinavia. I remember like already like 15 years ago. So it's yeah. really rare to be in an airport when you have like you know, looking for people and stuff. It's really, really bizarre. It's quite jarring, yeah. Actually, and that's the last bit of the story. So, you know, I've done all these flights. I'm like, okay, I'm just ready to go home. We're sitting in the BA flight. And uh, suddenly the captain comes on the PA and says, well, uh, we're all ready and everything, but uh, we seem to have lost 30 passengers. We don't know where they are. 30? 30? Were they... Ugh. 
And they were they were not coming from another flight? No, because their luggage were in the hall, which I guess was the problem. Because if it was one, they could have removed that one. But yeah. searching for 30... And he basically oh. said that. He said, we're going to wait because looking for 30 luggages in the hall might take more time than actually finding these people because they must be somewhere in the airport. <laughs> and then they arrived. There was clearly like some students, probably even like, I don't know, a school trip or something. Mm. All of us were looking at them. Was, I mean, it was fine. I mean, I don't I didn't care. But it was really fun how the pilot engaged with us at all time, right, making right. very light of the situation. They probably had a coffee somewhere and forgot. Completely forgot, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, a few things about Sky Team because I'm not going to fly a lot Sky Team. Maybe you will because you're free now, like as you said. Yeah. Uh, there was one good thing about calling Flying Blue, which is a program of Air France. I call them; they recognize automatically my phone number. And the first thing she says on the phone is, "Oh, can you give me the pin code which I sent you?" I'm like, "What?" And they just had sent me as I was not even starting speaking to this lady. They sent me a pin code to make sure it was me. I just had to read her back, and that was it. There was no security questions. No, it That's was cool. so good. That's so much easier. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, WhatsApp has launched a business model. They will yes. charge businesses that don't reply within 24 hours. I, I love this. This is so good. This is such a great stick to, uh, to well, beat businesses into answering their customers quickly and efficiently. I still think that for airlines, they should lower that to one hour. <laughs> yes, I agree. Where time really is of the essence. <laughs> Uh, so uh, one of the airlines of uh, of Sky Team is Alitalia. We still don't know what's going on with them. Uh, no. Basically, the government is trying to refuse everyone else who is not Italian. So they refuse the offer for Lufthansa, from EasyJet, from Wizz Air, from one capital investment like private private equity or something. And they're now trying to marry to force the train company in Italy to buy Alitalia. <laughs> Like what? It's, this it's is so so self defeating, isn't it? To the point that Air France, Delta, and KLM are basically recreating a JV, and this time they're not onboarding El Italia. They're really understanding this is not Ouch. going anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're like I said, they're they're completely screwing themselves here, and they're even getting a, a bridge loan by the state, which is completely against the rules of the EU. So I, I'm not sure where it's gonna gonna go. It's 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 really and all that while you know Air Italy is free to buy a lot of aircraft and basically taking over the, all the routes. I'm sure it's gonna be. I mean, it's I I I don't know, man. I I would be afraid to fly Air Italia because I would be afraid that. I buy a ticket and the next day they go out of business and I get nothing. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's the, that's the real fear. Or they 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 pull things back so much that it's a nightmare. Or the, or like you said, they they go out of business. But I don't think uh, they're long for this world, at least in their current incarnation. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. You remember we talked about Norwegian having this Singapore airline A through AT via iFly, and uh, they are now charging you if you want to get to the suites. I don't understand why they didn't do that since the start, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Why, there's, there's so many of these decisions now, you're like, why, didn't they, why haven't they always done this? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, if you are premium economy in Norwegian, you probably get the business seats, which is great. But how do mm -hmm. you get, you know, and I, I guess people were just given like these fantastic suites out of just, I don't know. Luck. You know, so now you have to pay, I think it's $400. But there, there's a lot of people that are saying that Norwegian actually might be losing money on, on by using these uh, 380. And that's not even talking about the compensation they might be having since all the delays with GFK. They say that there's no way they're making money out of... I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much uh, Rolls-Royce is paying them. I think it's going to be a lot of money. But still, this hasn't been good for anybody. And whether you get a suite on a high-fly 380 or not, I think... Um, this is inconvenient so many people and so many airlines that I, I can't... I, I don't even know when this is going to end either. That's the crazy thing. All the while, Royal Source is announcing that they're doing a flying taxi. I'm like, don't you have it? All yeah, I think you've got some other things to be focused on. <laughs> Ed Parsons uh, has uh, had also luck having uh, an aircraft change. This time, British Airways and British Airways, probably for capacity issues. I don't know if it's anything to do with the Dreamliner. He got, believe it or not... A Boeing business jet, a BBJ, what? for a flight from London to Spain. 
This is awesome. That's like, amazing. I mean, why does it never happen to us? Ed, what's your secret? Yeah, how did you do that? I want to know <laughs> everything. I think it's an aircraft from Private Air. I think that's a Geneva-based, uh, Swiss-based company. But still, they were... But that that's further is our point what we said in the last episode. There's really no aircraft available for anyone. They're going wherever they can to fill for capacity. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? That I never thought we'd get to this point. No, I mean either. Absolutely not. But it's... Uh, yeah, I want to fly also... A, why don't I get I get only the, the older aircraft from British Airways? I'm flying them tomorrow morning, and I'm sure I'm going to get like a A319 dating from 1978 or something. No, I'm kidding, guys. <laughs> I'm not. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, talking about our old aircraft, the 747. Have you seen any 47s when you were on the ground, in, or are they really gone? I have not seen many. Not in the U.S. anyway. I think um, we went to a, a beach near LAX and there were some flying over, but not not many. So um, to say one good thing about United for once, United uh, did this ceremony, the last uh, revenue fly with 747s. Then they allowed people to fly the 747 to the assembly center. So where they were going to deassemble the aircraft, which I found pretty nice. Oh, wow, that is cool. And they also did uh, a party. The party was between San Francisco and Honolulu. They allowed people to do a tour of the disassembly center of the factory to see. So they went until the last possible. Of course, some people will say, yeah, they were making money. I don't know. But it's I like that. United for that, I mean, guys, hats off, because I like that you are celebrating the end of the 747 in a, such a good manner. Yeah, the the 747 has been a part of their fleet for a very, very long time, so I'm glad that they gave it the, the send-off it deserves. In the US, uh, you'll get the um, Air Force Ones, the new ones, will be also 747s. That's true. I think, but I'm not sure that these are the ones, because, you know, I remember Donald Trump was trying to negotiate the price of them. I think these are the ones that were built for uh, Transaero, you know, the Russian yes. carrier? Yes. Which, okay, by the way, a Russian carrier that becomes Air Force One, that, there's a lot of jokes in that one, actually. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they do, yeah exactly. They pretty much write themselves. <laughs> one story, again, about military aircraft, because I found it very fun. And I, was it you that found it? I don't remember. You remember that can of Red Bull? What is it? Is it like, uh, I think, a transporter? Yeah, I think it was like... Uh... Actually, I don't know what it was. I'm not sure. But anyway, one pilot has a can of Red Bull because he wants to drink Red Bull, which is totally fine. <laughs> Only that the Red Bull spills over, destroys the flight controls. So they had to go back to base and everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they say that that little spill from a can of Red Bull costs the, the Air Force, I think, $120,000. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I might be way off here, but I think it was like uh, the military version of the CRJ. Maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm probably way off. That That's what rings a bell anyway. And they say that that's why they force pilots, I mean the crew, to have mugs that are designed for it, mm -hmm. which are very expensive to do. And I'm wondering, it doesn't seem to be as stringent in commercial aircraft, so... Guys, I know we have a lot of pilots actually listen to because we're getting a lot of messages. Have you ever spilled coffee on your flight controls? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and do they make you use a, a specific type of, of mug to prevent such spillages? <laughs> you should try to ask that from your pilot on your return BA flight. Let me see your mug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, a few more news to cap that uh, short episode off. Uh, first, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're sad or not. Uh, BA is ending these uh, 767 operations. No more yeah, 767. I, I think I am quite sad about this because they were a little bit of a link to the past because they never upgraded the interior style. So while they were obviously upgraded a little bit, they they still had the old school business class layout they had those tiny strange little monitors in the front of the airplane uh and it was nice to do short haul in a wide body from time to time yeah especially in a world where we do like long haul in a narrow body now i mean uh, i think they have seven remaining that are being faded or have be already been faded i know that the first two for sure are in uh, st Athen, which is the raf base why, by the way, why would they put them there? Do you know? I think that they're being converted to, for military use. Oh. That is my, is my guess. But they, I think what caught a lot of people off guard is that they're, we all knew that they were going to retire them because they're all very old, but they are retiring them much faster than I think a lot of us thought they would, which is, uh, again, a, sh a shame because they used them on Istanbul. Um, 
Stockholm, Frankfurt. Stockholm, yeah. They actually used Athens. them on like Glasgow and places like yeah. that. From yeah, time I've been to, to I've been to Edinburgh with it. Uh, mm. Back from Edinburgh with a 767, which was the first flight of the day was actually full. So maybe that explains it. But uh, yeah, that was super cool. I was like, I'm doing a domestic UK flight with a 767. Holy wow. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's yeah, fun but, uh, to do stuff like that. But I'm sad. Yeah, still. I am too. I am too. I would always opt for one when I had that on my booking, when I saw that. I was like, oh, yeah, let me try to get the 767. I, I know they flew a lot to Athens as well. I was like, I'm going to wait for, I think it was a 10 p.m. I don't remember, but I will get that one because I know it's 767. Yeah, yeah, which, well, exactly. So which reminds me, we, we never talked about that. The Not demise, but the lowering of ITA Matrix. Yeah, they, I don't, I, this is clearly Google doing something to force people to use Google Flights because it's not nearly as powerful as it used to be. You you cannot search for multiple airports that are not in the same country. That's so bad. Which is really dumb. And also, the accuracy of the results has degraded substantially, uh, where you cannot recreate the fares and if you call up an airline they give you an exasperated sigh when you say i found this on ita matrix they they're just not accurate anymore it's such a shame because it was such a great tool for finding really good fares this inability to say uh i want to fly from i don't know ethro amsterdam Charles de gaulle munich uh, budapest i don't know you take like five or six and say Get me to Hong Kong and see where is the most competitive. You cannot do it anymore. You have to do five different searches and hoping that the search are actually valid, which clearly you can also do on, on Google Flights. But Google Flights, for me, it was all about the speed, but never about the breadth of results and attempts you could do. Because you can you could specify so many things on ITA Matrix, you know, like the fare class, um, yeah, I mean, and uh, so many they had these. What do they call them? Did they call them switches or something that you could put in on it? And that's how I always found those amazing BA first when you booked business on American fares. Yeah, it's really sad, especially it, it again, sad. especially for us probably because we know that we're gonna always get more expensive flights leaving from the UK. So that was a bit our game. Okay. Can I just reposition myself into Stavanger, Amsterdam, near enough airports to see if suddenly the price drops by 50%? And that would actually happen quite often. Yes. Which was why I was using it, because we are in the one of the most, if not the most expensive airport in the world. So mwah, I'm really disappointed. I don't know what they haven't come. I mean, it's Google, so they won't comment on it. But it's it's frustrating because... You can't, while Google Flights is great and it's absolutely my, my weapon of choice for finding flights generally, you can't do that level of tinkering that yeah. you could with ITA Matrix. And did you not mention to me, it's still not the golden standard because you still have routes and or airlines and or options that no matter how many attempts I do with Google Flights, I'm not finding them, but I will find them on Kayak or Momondo or on yes. Skyscanner. You said that you were looking for flights in Asia, Japan, I don't remember where it was, and you yeah. said, I cannot find anything on Google Flights. They do not appear. And you switch, I think, to Kayak, Kayak and suddenly yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Intra-Japan flights and, and actually intra-Asia flights. I don't know. Google is weirdly lacking, but Kayak, the, every option seemed to surface. So Google Flights cannot be, guys, if you are a bit like us and you want to find... Either good deals like specific routes or multi-city that are really out of the way of usual stuff, you should still go on other OTAs as well because Google Flight is the fastest for sure. It has the best um, prediction system as well. It, it will let you know that the price might increase because a lot of data and they make good use. I mean, it's Google, but they still don't have everything. And uh, I do not believe, I know that we have some Google employees actually listening to us, but I do not believe that it is impossible. You just don't want to Google to allow us to do multiple different country origin cities. You just don't want to. Yeah, I don't understand the rationale behind that because we it, it worked fine in the past. I'd love to know the reason behind it. Yeah, if, if, if at least they had said, okay, we're switching that off from IT Matrix, but we're allowing you to do it from Google Flights. Maybe I would say, okay, maybe they really are transitioning us to go to everything Google Flights and Google Flights maybe within the next two to three years will be the almost equivalent 
of yeah. IT matrix with a much more modern interface. But yeah. not, at least not that I see currently. So it's I'm I'm really disappointed at Google for doing that. Yeah, I am I am too. It's frustrating that that's that this tool has been crippled. And there's literally no tool online to do nope. these type of searches. No. Nope. I've tried everything, even Kiwi, K I W I uh, dot com. You can do some searches from multiple origins. It kind of works, but the results are a bit sometimes shaky. There's not a single tool. So you now we just I just spend way more time trying all the different variants with like 25 windows opens in front of my screen. <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating. It's really annoying. Yeah. Anyway, um, we don't uh, always believe in uh, the uh, metrics of uh, Sky Tracks, but they released, uh, like every year, like clockwork, the world's best airlines, according to surveys and et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to go there. It's just fun to mention them. So Qatar Airways is no longer number one. It's Singapore Airlines. Wow. They've really kind of gone through this... Uh recovery period haven't they because we were yeah. we were worried about them a few years ago but they've really seemed to have turned a corner qatar is number two now and again i keep saying that qatar i mean again skytrax is a lot of issues but qatar when we're talking 350 the newly refurbished triple seven er these are amazing uh when you go to 340s 330s you discuss a lot of it as, as amazing to be honest with you yeah uh number three is ana Number four is Emirates. No surprise there. Number five is Eva Air. I really have to try Eva Air. Yeah, me too. Number six is Cathay. Uh, I would yeah. have seen them higher. Yeah, I think uh, inconsistencies are perhaps what are getting them down. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they're always in there. They're always in the mix. It's like the Premier League. It's the same six teams. It's just where they're going to stack up at the end of every season that you that you actually have to yeah. think about. Uh, we've seen that Cathay has still announced a few losses, by the way. They're, uh, they're okay, but they're not great still. They're still, they've got a long way to go. Yeah. Hainan is number eight. It's Lufthansa 7, number eight. Hainan, I don't know how long they can survive with all the depth, but let's see. Mm, well, exactly. <laughs> the most interesting was China Southern went from 23rd to 14th. I've flown them like once a very, very long time ago. And we said a few times that we're not always keen to flying uh, Chinese air- airlines, but... Maybe they're doing something right. Maybe we should actually try them. Yeah, I've I've heard good things about them. I'd like to give them a whirl. Anyway, like a few others, you can find the list on Skytrax, guys. And another list of numbers, because Alex and myself were having uh, debates about that, is a number of passengers flown through airports last year. So if you only count international passengers and non-domestic passengers... Dubai is number one at 87.7 million passengers. It's a lot. Man, it it's is. crazy. This And this airport is really bursting out, it seems. They need this new airport. Heathrow is number two at 73 million. Hong Kong, number three at 72.4 million. So very close in Amsterdam, Charles de Gaulle, Singapore, etc., etc., etc. Massive airports. But even if you count all the passengers, including domestic, then suddenly you have... <laughs> Hartsfield Jackson's Atlanta shouts up to the first place at 103 million passengers. Holy Amazing. God. Crazy. A Beijing number two at 95 million because, of course, a lot of domestic passengers. Dubai number three at 88 million, which shows the difference between that and the number I told you previously. Basically, everybody in Dubai flies internationally. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, exactly. You were near uh, Sharjah. Weren't you at an event last year? Yes. You were telling me about the airport. There's now, I think, there's a low-cost airline, Air Arabia, that will allow you to fly from Sharjah to Europe. Yeah, they, they, that's where they're based. They had a lot of comings and goings, but I didn't know that they were going to be starting European services. So there you go. That's going to be a lower cost and allows us to actually try Sharjah. So actually, I might, I might try them once because I want to see Sharjah from like a passenger perspective as well. So <laughs> It's a very, yeah, it's an uh, unusual place. So did you bring your uh, family to In-N-Out? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they liked it. Uh, Proud Bird as well, which is at the other end of the of the runway. or the, It's at the end of the other set of runways, the southerly set of runways as well. So yeah. And then Dockweiler Beach, which is at the, uh, the <laughs> westerly end of the runway, which is also a great public beach as well. You did all of them. 
Yeah, they, lo- they my kids <laughs> like it as well. So we yeah, of had course. fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to you have to teach your daughter as well. Exactly. Yeah, she was fascinated by it. <laughs> Who wouldn't be that again? Uh, so yeah, so you actually make good on your promise to Anita because you, you mentioned that in the last episode. I'm sorry to talk about that, guys, because by the time this is in the air, you won't be able to try it. But I still have to mention it. Delta and Virgin Atlantic just open a pop-up pub here in London. These two airlines go to 230 destinations in the US, which is quite a lot. Yeah. They have 230 craft beers at that pop-up in London. Wow, this is that amazing. is impressive. Of all the regions to go to, this is really, really good. And it's only from the, the 10th, so four days ago, to the 19th. So you're going to miss it as well, Alex. I'm sorry. Ah. All you guys, sorry, because I'm talking f- for that for you will be in the past. But they have like a New York night. They have a Boston night. They have a Seattle night. They have an Atlanta night. And they and they also it's open all day long. They have food. And it's really, that's a really cool marketing thing to do i love that i think they call it the joint venture pub or something whatever but it's joint still venture pub <laughs> it's still a good I, I love it i haven't been able to visit it and since i'm flying tomorrow sadly i'll miss it as well but i'm i, I like that kind of stuff it's, i do too they should be also open an, a betsy uh, pop-up thing in oh, here that'd be nice and they should actually have the the air within the bar being the same as the pressurize in the air that would it's, i'm sure it's feasible somehow oh definitely yeah and then we'll be able to actually taste the real betsy in london Cathay pacific get on the program there you and- go <laughs> Okay, the airport, Honolulu. You said you'd been there, but you were the age of your daughter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you cannot remember it. I so, don't remember <laughs> anything about it. Hold on. So you, you live in California. You love Japan. Okay, that was much later in your life. But you've never stopped in between. I don't get that, Alex. You have nope. to go to Honolulu once. I mean, it's, uh, it's like almost like cliche, but you have to try it once. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be the most popular vacation destination for people on the West Coast. Hawaii in general, perhaps not Honolulu. Yeah, exactly. So I was about to say that. I've only been, so I've been to Honolulu, I was for an event, so I've never visited the breadth of beautiful places that you know, all the islands offer. So I've, I've, I've seen a bit around the main, uh, that island, but I've never seen the rest. So I know it's much more than that. So it's true that uh, Honolulu itself is, uh, is, for me, it feels like, oh, there's an American city on the Pacific. It's, it's, it's a bit um, awkward because when you go to places like you've been to Okinawa or you go to any of the islands in the South Pacific, you expect this kind of, I know it's cliche and we shouldn't do cliche, but you expect some like a bit, you know, non-urban places, right? Mm-hmm. And really Honolulu is like, hmm. Okay, this is really America in the middle of the Pacific. It's really... Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. But it's really fun. I had a lot of fun, obviously. It was really cool. And the airport itself is... uh, It's not a really big airport, although it is in terms of passenger, maybe 20... I don't remember, 25, 30 million. It's not a small airport, but it's not a hub of this world. Do you know what is the heaviest route there? I would imagine somewhere in Japan. Yeah, it's Tokyo to Honolulu, which beats LA to Honolulu and San Francisco to Honolulu. Yeah, Tokyo I, is the... I believe it. Yeah. And then you also have number four, I think, is Osaka. Because for Japan, I think for those who have been listening to us for quite a while, you know. But if you haven't, it's a very, very popular destination for honeymoons from Japan to go to Honolulu. Uh, and that's where I flew when I did it. I flew... Uh, Northwest, I said. I remember I flew and I was, I'm not a big fan of the 330. And I flew a Northwest 330, 300. And I was like, meh. But I flew back with the 747. So that was really cool. Though. <laughs> I remember because I was on the upper deck 77A, which is the exit row on in business class. It was fantastic. Guys, Delta, bring back this aircraft now. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. The airport is nothing special. The one thing that is, uh, of course, special is because it's, it's, you know, the great weather. It's a lot open. You're walking outside a lot. You can even, I think, walk from international to domestic because there are like some small flights to go to the other island. Just walking airside and you're outside and that's it. And it's you can walk. You don't even need to take a bus. So that, should, that tells you that it's not such a big airport. That's a nice uh, way to do it. Yeah. Immigration. So I was coming, as I told you guys, from Japan. Immigration. Immigration is a tad long, uh, and it still apparently is, because obviously, again, this is uh, an American airport. The majority of people come from the U.S. It's a domestic, yeah. uh, you know, it's a domestic flight. Um, there's 
no good food whatsoever in that airport. So maybe now Honolulu friends or Hawaiian friends, please tell us I'm wrong. But I think that all the food in this airport is crap, which is a shame because you guys have so much great food over there. It just doesn't work. Yeah, and it's surprising because Hawaiian food in general is pretty good. So it's such a shame they haven't uh, taken advantage of that. But other than that, look, if you arrive there, the one tip I will tell you is that if you have to go through immigration, take account between 60 and 90 minutes by the time you land to the time you're actually on the curve about to leave. That's not That's a long super, time. Yeah, it's, it, but it's not the greatest, the most efficient one. But people are super welcoming. It's probably the best immigration I ever did in the US. I mean, I had good experiences in other immigration, even including JFK or LAX. But then the demeanor, the welcoming attitude is so cool. That you're like, oh, whatever, I'll wait. Plus, I'm outside and the weather yeah. is great. So what? You know, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard uh, to get mad at that. No, nah, exactly. That's my take on this airport. Uh, it's very central. So you don't have to basically drive then a long way to actually go to the city. So it's actually pretty. It's on the sea. You know, one, even a, I'm pretty sure one of the runways actually built uh, as reclaimed land. Yeah. Really close, really practical. But I would encourage you to go there, not do a layover there, because as I just said, it's near to the city. Just go and get some great local food, great local craft beers. By the way, I'm not sure that Joint Venture Bar has some. Probably they have like some Hawaiian craft beers. Hawaiian there. beers, yeah. With nah. 60, it's probably a pretty good, pretty safe bet. <laughs> Great destination is really far from us living in Europe, but um, when I was living in Japan, I did it, and I was really happy to do that. I, I always remember because you know what? It was my um, the way back. I didn't stop at Narita. I went on to Manila, then Manila to Abu Dhabi, then Abu Dhabi to somewhere in Europe. <laughs> that was just wow. One of my longest ever days in flight. The airline I took then is the airline I'm flying tomorrow as well. It's also a very long flight. Uh, you are flying. The next one is back here, I think. Yeah, in nine days back to England on BA on a Dreamliner. Dreamliner is good. Uh, yes. Long- <laughs> I'm also going to fly a Dreamliner. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping these uh, Trent 1000 engines will uh, support me and support yeah. you. Uh, because if not, we won't be able to record another time. But I'm sure they will. And I'm sure we'll see each other for uh, our next episode. And until then, happy flying. Safe travels, guys.